All right, welcome back to Investing Wizards. I have the pleasure of having Jonah Lupton of Lupton Capital. Jonah, welcome to the show. How are you, Rob? I'm doing well, thank you. So uh, just to give people a overview and a sense of your background, uh, just tell us uh, kind of how you got into investing and uh, a brief uh, background on, on your career. Yep, so I graduated college back in 2002. Uh, right after college, I started with Morgan Stanley in their wealth management group spent the next 10 or 11 years uh, running outside capital at different wealth management firms and uh, private trust companies for primarily high net worth individuals, and then some institutions, endowments, uh, pension plans, et cetera. And then after the financial crisis, I sort of burned out from the industry, just you know that two and a half year grind through the financial crisis really just wore me down. So I left the industry, I became a internet entrepreneur, started some internet businesses, did that for five or six years, tried a couple more things, you know, at the same time managing my own capital during that time, just not managing any outside capital. And then I was most recently running a business uh, where we sold to the construction industry, but the pandemic really wiped out that business, as you can imagine. Uh, so for the last year and a half, I've been back in the industry, I guess you could say, uh, still managing my own capital. I don't manage any outside capital, but then I do run a uh, Substack newsletter and a stock Twitch room where I share my, my portfolio, my trades, my charts, my commentary, et cetera, to try to help other retail investors manage their portfolios. Cool, that's awesome, cool background, and I could definitely relate to the uh, internet entrepreneur part, at least. Um, <laughs> What, uh, uh, what's like, if you had to describe your investment style, uh, what would it be? So definitely growth investor. Uh, I do have a couple like value stocks in my portfolio. Uh, I mean, I guess you could call them value stocks cause they're trading at very cheap multiples. Uh, but they're also growing 40, 50, 60%. So it's almost like some of these stocks nowadays, uh, I don't even know where to call them, like where, which bucket they fall into, uh, you know, they're in semiconductors and shipping, uh, so they have a little bit of both, but primarily it's it's growth investor. Uh, I lean towards small and mid cap, but I do have probably 25% of my portfolio in in large caps. Uh, I actually started a position this morning in Palantir, uh, but you know small small position. Uh, so typically I'm holding 20 to 30 stocks. Um, I would say like I I put them into two buckets. I would say one bucket is profitable growth stocks. Um, like an upstart, like a Celsius, and then the other half or the other bucket are unprofitable growth stocks, like a Dermtech, a Clearpoint, a Desktop Metal, a STEM, where you know I think these companies are going to be tremendous businesses with huge growth potential over the next two or three years, but you know they're losing money right now as they invest into that growth. Um, so those are the stocks that you have to be a little bit more patient with. You know, those are the ones that have certainly not performed as well this year. You know, the stocks that have done well this year are the profitable growth stocks. So, you know, that bucket is Upstart, Celsius, uh, a company called Zim Shipping, uh, Himax, which is a technology semiconductor company. And then I've started some new positions recently in um, Zoom Info, uh, which, which reported really strong uh, Q2 numbers. Uh, like I said, I started uh, Palantir today. And I even got into a stock like Roku uh, a couple of days ago, just a sort of a hedge against like the reopening trade. You know, I would say most of my stocks benefit from the pandemic being over, but I want to still have a few stocks in there in case this pandemic kind of lingers through the fall. You know, stocks like Roku would, would probably still do well and, and kind of act as a, a hedge in my portfolio. Cool. So it sounds like you have um, uh, you're kind of picking stocks from different buckets, not to be overly exposed to one theme or one factor, which is which is always uh, a good idea. So you know maybe that could dive into uh, a little bit philosophically. Um, maybe you could tell us the way that you manage capital today, kind of your uh, portfolio management style and your investment style and the way you think about risk. How's that different than it was in? 2006, 2007, not kind of like at the top of the market, but sounds like that was just when you were getting started. Uh, like, what do you, what are you thinking about today? That's, that's different that kind of investors that are, that are listening could take away from your experience. 
I mean, I'm 10 times more aggressive now than I was 10 years ago, probably, you know, because when you were when you work at the wealth management firm or an RIA or a private trust company and you're managing money for high, work, high net worth individuals, the game is sort of more about capital preservation than it is capital appreciation. You know, since I'm managing my own money right now and I'm only 40 years old, I can afford to be a little bit more aggressive and take risks. And if I lose money or if I, you know, uh, have a bad trade, it's only my capital that's at risk. Uh, you know, when you're managing money for someone that spent the last 30 years of their life accumulating that net worth, you know, you don't want to put it at risk with any of these, you know, small cap risky stocks that I, that I invest in nowadays. So, you know, back then, I mean, I was really, you know, you're running a, a large cap portfolio of, you know, Walmarts and Apples and Googles and those types of companies, although you go back 10 or 12 years and, you know, Google was probably considered speculative and, and even Apple is nowhere close to where it is today. So I couldn't even tell you what stocks we used to own back then. Um, but, you know, as, as, as you manage your own capital, you, re, you know, you learn what your risk tolerance is and what sort of volatility you're willing to accept in your portfolio and what kind of a drawdown you're willing to, you know, absorb in the short term, assuming that you still have convictions in your stocks. But, you know, I do some hedging. Uh, I will buy put options sometimes on my largest positions. Uh, I do use stop losses on a lot of my positions, uh, especially when I'm looking at the charts and the technicals and, you know, there's a support line or a moving average that I really, you know, where the stock is currently trading above. And if it breaks through that moving average, you know, let's call it the 200 day or breaks that up, you know, that, that, that uptrend line, uh, you know, that's where I want the stop loss to kick in and, you know, get me out of that position before any more damage is done. So, you know, I think I've been saying since the beginning of the year, you know, this is going to be a choppy market through this whole year. And that's certainly what you've seen. I'm still surprised that some of the large cap names have done so well compared to the small mid cap stocks, which have really just gotten pounded for the last six or seven months. But, you know, I think this is the kind of year where you really buy and hold is not necessarily the best strategy. You really have to be nimble and willing to, you know, take some profits and lock in gains when you can, and then, you know, wait for that next dip because there's, you know, there's so much economic data coming out and then Fed tapering and interest rates. Like there's just a million reasons why this market could pull back five, 10, 15%. So I want to have some, some cash available if that happens. Yeah. That, that optionality and, and kind of like to manage the risk to be able to add on those dips um, both from a uh, uh, mental perspective and from a portfolio perspective, there's there's nothing more powerful than that. Um, cool. So um, I think you know that's uh, I think that's a great overview, and uh, thank you for sharing that background. Why don't we sort of um, flip it around to talking about some specific stock ideas? And okay. I'll, sh I'll share my screen and have you walk us through some names. So hold on one second. Yeah, I'm trying to think which stocks I want to give you. So, I mean, coming into this year, uh, Upstart was one of my largest positions. And as most people know, Upstart's had an incredible year so far. I think it's up 400% year to date. Um, so, I mean, we can just look at that one real quick. I mean, this has just been an absolute crazy, crazy stock. Uh, huge rips and then huge dips. So <laughs> it's been a lot, you know, this one's shaken out a lot of people on those big pullbacks. Uh, thankfully, I stuck with it. So I've been rewarded. So, so it's, a, it's a $15 billion company. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, tell, tell us kind of like um, the quick overview on what, what Upstart does and why you're excited about it. So the company came public in December uh, at somewhere in the 30s, like low 30s. Uh, I did a write-up on the company in late December when the stock was trading in the high 30s. So my first purchase was around $38, and then I've continued to add to it since then. Uh, and it, you know, like uh, back then, it was a mid-cap stock. So it rallied in the beginning of the year, got up to like 105, and then pulled back to 65. And then when they reported their Q4 numbers, uh, they beat pretty. They they beat the you know the Q4 estimates, but they raised the guidance for the year from about 350 million to 500 million. So that's that's what you know right now that that big gap up that you're that you just pointed to that was from the big um, guidance raise. Uh, and then you know the stock you know kind of after it ripped up to from 65 up into the like 165 range. I think I think it was like a 
a three Xer in like three or four trading days. It was just bonkers and then pulled all the way back down to 80. Um, and then, you know, you sort of saw the whole thing play out again when they got to their Q1 earnings report. They blew the numbers out again and then raised guidance from 500 to 600. And then we just got the same thing a couple of weeks ago. They blew out numbers again for Q2 and raised guidance from 600 million to 750 million. So, you know, in the last three reports that we've seen this year, I mean, this company continues to just beat estimates, their own estimates, and raise guidance pretty substantially because they're just firing on all cylinders. You know, they're a, they're, they're, some people will call them a lending company. They're not a lending company. They're a software company that built these, let's call them AI lending models, and they essentially license those models out to their bank partners so their bank partners can do a better job at underwriting personal loans, but now they're expanding into auto loans, and there's some suspicion that they might get into home loans at some point. If you go to their careers page on their website, you can actually see them doing some hiring in the, the mortgage space for product managers in mortgages. So, you know, there's a lot of op optionality coming with this company. When they came public in December, they had 10 bank partners, and now they're up to 25 bank partners. And I think they can probably get to 35 or 40 by the end of this year. So the estimates that are like the estimates that are out there right now for 2022 are way too low. Um, I mean, they should do at least 800 million this year. And I think there's a good chance they get to maybe 1.5 billion next year. Uh, I mean, the estimates are obviously not even close to that. So you're going to start to see a lot of revisions upwards from analysts as they continue adding these these bank partners and then expand into new credit verticals. So uh, this is still my largest position uh, by a pretty large margin because I really haven't trimmed it at all over the last few months. I've just been adding on all the dips. Um, so it's it's uh, this one has definitely kept my portfolio looking good this year. <laughs> That's I've awesome. had a couple I've had a couple of big misses on small caps, but this this one more than makes up for the misses. That's 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 nice to have such a such a big winner um, and such a nice uh, a good strong offset for some of the other weaker positions. Um, and then kind of like what you were talking about here, the year started off. So this is kind of this first unreported fiscal year started at uh, three hundred fifty five million, and then right now where uh, analysts are estimating around seven hundred twenty five, <laughs> and so. That's a, that's a big difference. That's a big difference. So kind of like in one year, uh, more than doubled the, the revenue estimate. And then you're saying kind of like your expectations for the next two years are much higher than this sort of. Yeah, one, I mean, one you know, they, they've already proven that they're going to under promise and over deliver. And they obviously like to beat estimates and then raise guidance. So I got to assume that they probably left some juice in the tank for Q3 and Q4. So if they're already guiding to 750 million for this year, I got to believe that at least 800 million is probably within reach. Um, and then assuming that they continue to add two or three new bank partners every month, which is kind of the trend that they've been on all year, you know, that takes us somewhere between 35 and 40 by the end of this year. Uh, and if they can get to that many bank partners, I think that sets them up for, you know, somewhere between 1.2 and 1.6 a billion next year. But, and that's not even including what they might do in auto loans or home loans. You know, those, those both provide massive upside because right now they're really just doing personal loans and the personal loan market is like an ant, you know, the size of an ant compared to what auto lending and home lending is combined. So, uh, you know, they, they've talked about doing, starting with personal loans because it's the hardest because it's unsecured debt. Uh, and if they can if they can nail it in personal, then there's really there's no other market that they can't do or that they can't make a difference in. Uh, and on their last earnings call, uh, a couple banks actually said that they're getting rid of the FICO score requirements in their underwriting process mm -hmm. because they believe that the upstart AI models are just that much better than FICO score now. Are they, so is upstart using FICO in its models? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's all up to the customers. They can sort of pick and choose what they want. But as of now, FICO is part of those models, mm -hmm. but the customers, those bank partners have the ability to turn off FICO if they want. Got it. And so what, what is the competitive landscape look like? Are these, is, is Upstart um, actually making, so are they making the loans themselves and providing no, the technology? No, no. I mean, they're not, so, 
Yeah, they're 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 not doing any lending themselves. They're mm -hmm. really just licensing these models and then providing the you know kind of the front end software. You know that entire experience for the customer. Mm -hmm. You know that's all built and sort of managed by Upstart. So it's almost like a white like it's kind of like a white label service um, powered by Upstart. But the customer of the bank doesn't really know that. You know they just assume they're on the bank's website. And they just assume everything's going through the bank. They don't realize that Upstart's really powering that underwriting process on the back end. Um, but Upstart doesn't do any lending themselves, so there's really no credit risk to them. Mm -hmm. And what's nice, you know, what what keeps this flywheel going is there's 150 institutional partners that are buying these loans off of the bank partners. Mm -hmm. So somewhere around 20 or 25 percent of the loans. Um, that are being made by the bank partners are retained on those bank partners' balance sheets. And then the other 75 to 80% is sold off to these institutional partners. Got it. Interesting. And what are the, um, who are the other companies that, that are in the space that they're competing with? I mean, there's no, as far as I can tell, there's no one that's doing this at, on their level, you know, with the sophisticate, sophistication of their AI models. Um, they talk about like 1,600 data points in their models. And because they've been doing this for eight and a half years now, there's like 15 billion data points in total um, mm -hmm. that they're able to use that, you know, obviously help this AI get smarter and smarter. Uh, some of the others that are close are like Lending Club. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe Lending Club is actually a, a bank. So they might be lending off of their own balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So there might be some credit risk there versus with Upstart, there's not. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, if you look at like, none of the big banks are really doing this. None of the regional banks are doing this. And I think over time, some of those larger banks are going to want to partner with Upstart so that Upstart can then power part of their underwriting as well. You know, because I just don't think a lot of these larger financial institutions are going to want to, you know, bring on their own engineers and hire their own AI experts and, and whatnot just to replicate what Upstart has already built and spent the last eight and a half years perfecting. Yeah. To, to kind of like provide that I mean, coming. And provide there's, there, I mean, there are, there are literally thousands of banks in this country. Like it's bonkers how many banks there are, right. credit unions, community banks, et cetera. I mean, we know all the big ones because the big ones basically control like half of all the deposits. Um, but there are thousands of these smaller regional community and credit unions um, that certainly need help on the technology side. And that's where Upstart can, uh, can help them. Cool. So, you know, but I mean, like, it's hard, like, I'm still bullish on Upstart, obviously, for the next three or four years, I think uh -huh. they're going to, you know, they're going to grow into a $50 billion company in the next few years. And, you know, maybe at some point, they're even a $100 billion company. But, you know, like, this one's already up 400% year to date. So yeah. it's kind of like, I'm not putting any new capital to work in the stock right now. Um, but I'm still bullish, because it is my largest position, and I'm not trimming it down yet. Um, but I'm not adding new capital to it. So if you want to talk about some of the ones that I'm adding to, you know, we can certainly do that as well. Yeah. Let's, so before we, we turn it um, to a new one, I just want to ask you about Lending Club. Have you looked at the stock at all? Just because I have not in a long time in this chart. Looks um, really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've never owned it. So I've never done like significant due diligence on it. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it, it, as I can see from the chart, I mean, that thing got down into the single digits last year, but they just reported a really, really strong Q2 number. Uh, and as you can see, it gapped up pretty big. So yeah, they're, I mean, they're doing a lot of things right. Like I don't, so I almost don't even consider them competitors because I think they're all, like they're all gonna be, you know, SoFi is another large investment of mine. You know, so mm -hmm. far, SoFi does uh, personal lending as well. Mm -hmm. And I think all of these companies are gonna be successful because they're all taking, uh, market share away from the big banks, you know, because these are all, these are essentially digital first companies. And, you know, a lot of people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s don't go into banks anymore. Right. Um, you know, like whenever I go into my local bank, because I have to do a wire transfer or order some new checks, you know, like the average age in there is like 80. I mean, it's just a bunch of old people have nothing better to do. I mean, no offense to them, but younger people don't go into the bank unless they really have to. So they're, you know, everyone prefers these digital first you know, fintech companies for all of their financial needs. Right. Absolutely. Um, so what, what is the next company that you want to talk about? Um, 
It's a good question. Uh, we can talk about STEM. So I'm actually interviewing the CEO on Wednesday. So uh, I've done a write-up on this. It's a, one of my 10 largest positions. I'm definitely pretty bullish on what they're doing. You know, this is a recent SPAC. So this stock, I mean, if you look at a longer chart, um, you can yeah. see this thing was way up like earlier in the year. Oh, no, 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 you're right. Yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, this is right. Um, yes, okay, so they, they, they de-spacked a, a few months ago. You know, they just went through some uh, lockup expirations and then warrant redemptions and all of that good stuff. So I think the stock's been punished, you know, maybe a little oversold down here, but essentially what they're doing, they're an, you know, once again, AI, you know, I mean, I obviously like these AI companies, but um, they're, they're a software company that is helping uh, Fortune 500 companies and utility companies uh, better manage their, you know, let's call it energy storage systems or energy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so they work with companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Walmart and Home Depot. Like those are all their customers. And some of those customers already have these, these uh, energy storage systems in place because they've already uh, invested in solar or wind or something else. Mm -hmm. um, but STEM has created a better software system to manage those energy storage systems. Um, and STEM doesn't, they don't manufacture any hardware. They partner with other manufacturers like Tesla and LG. So they're sort of, if they need to, they'll, they'll step in and resell uh, those, those hardware systems from other companies, you know, with like a 20 or 30% uh, gross margin, but really where the, you know, their secret sauce is in that software where they have 80% gross margins and they continue to win large projects. So they're working with, uh, renewable energy developers on both coasts. So the company's based in California. Most of their big wins recently were in California, but recently they've been winning some big projects in Massachusetts and New York. They just announced another big win in Brooklyn last week. Uh, and then they're working with one of the largest renewable energy project managers or developers in Massachusetts. So every time this company goes in and builds out a solar or a wind farm, they're implementing STEMS software to, to basically manage that hardware. Cool. So when you were talking about kind of like the description and um, the long-term opportunity for this company, like Tesla immediately went off because that's something that Elon has talked about in, in terms of like te Tesla being the battery storage of the house right. and, and, and being able to optimize that battery usage and storage over time. Um, and so how are, uh, how is them working with, uh, are they working with like a Tesla? Yep. Oh yeah. Yep. Tesla is one of the hardware providers they work with. Um, but right now STEM is only doing commercial. Although mm -hmm. I do think at some point they're going to want to get into the residential as well. Um, but they just see so much opportunity on the commercial side and obviously the projects are much, much larger. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tesla will be a big partner for them, so, you know, going forward. Now, I don't know if STEM would ever get acquired. I mean, obviously, you know, their market cap is in like the, or enterprise value is in like the $2.8 billion range, I think, yes. uh, with about five, yeah, there you go. Yeah, because they've got about $500 million in cash, uh, or they will after they, uh, you know, after these warrants get redeemed. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons, you know, so John Carrington is the CEO. He's a former GE guy. Um, so he knows the energy space very well. And he talked about the need to come public and, you know, get that cash onto the balance sheet so they can really execute on their growth strategy going forward. So uh, the company, they reported, you know, they reported solid Q2 earnings that were in line with estimates and they confirmed guidance for 2021. So, you know, a lot of these former SPACs are already missing their numbers right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, STEM is one of the companies that has already, uh, you know, reaffirmed their their prior guidance. So this year they'll do about 147. Next year the estimates are about 315. Um, so there's you know there's some pretty good revenue growth here going forward. Mm -hmm. And so how are you um, how are you thinking about the SPAC market in general? Um, there's obviously just been so much issuance this year and all different types types of companies. And you see here kind of like this uh, this chart. Uh, I'm not sure if it coincides exactly with how specs have done, but has this weakness been kind of like SPAC related because I see estimates 
or next yeah, podcast I mean, is actually coming up. Yeah, I mean, this, the stock probably got a little bit ahead of itself, um, you know, a few months back. But yeah, I mean, I think it's been unfairly sold off with the SPACs. I mean, I overall, I think this SPAC craze has been an absolute disaster for retail investors. You know, as we're seeing uh, a lot of SPACs, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, are already missing their estimates, like in their very first quarterly report and mm -hmm. pulling guidance or reducing guidance significantly. I mean, that is, that's just ridiculous. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, the SEC should probably be going after those those management teams and those sponsors, because whatever numbers they put into their investor presentations were obviously uh, way too bullish. Uh, mm. And whether or not that was planned or not, I have no way of knowing, but it's just kind of ridiculous to uh, to finalize the merger, de-SPAC, and then three months later, you're you know pulling guidance for the year or missing numbers by 50, 60%. That's just insane. So you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of disasters in this space. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of SPACs that are already trading 30, 40% below that $10 price. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw someone on Twitter post a stat. I think it was Friday afternoon. I think SPAC track said only, I think they said hundred, somewhere around 108 uh, SPACs have been completed this year, meaning the, you know they've already de-SPAC'd. And I think only 24% of them are above that $10 price. Uh, which is kind of scary. And there's a lot of them that are trading around three, four or five dollars right now. So now, I mean, if someone has some fresh cash to put to work and, you know, a longer term investment horizon, there's probably some great deals out there to be had. But, you know, I've I've gotten rid of a lot of the SPACs in my portfolio over the last three or four months. Um, and And so right now, like I have those two buckets, the profitable growth and the unprofitable growth. Um, and I, I dumped some SPACs, you know, like I said, back in March and April and added more of these profitable growth companies, which the market was obviously preferring at this time. Um, but STEM is one of those higher quality SPACs that uh, I have no interest in selling anytime soon. I think this company is going to be a big winner over the next three or four years as renewable energy becomes a, you know, a bigger goal for the United States and then other countries as well. Got it. Cool. And so when you say, so when this is kind of like um, a little higher quality on your list, is it, are you looking at gross profits, EBITDA, earnings per share? What are you looking at in terms of? Like yeah, I mean, a little bit of all of that. Um, yeah, not just revenue growth, but profitable revenue growth. So they're expected to be EBITDA positive next year, I believe still. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not one of these companies that's going to, you know, be hemorrhaging cash for the next four or five years yep. and then have to keep, you know, so they're either burning cash that's on the balance sheet or they have to go out and keep raising more capital and diluting shareholders. Like those are not the SPACs that I want anything to do with. So, you know, a company like this that has a great balance sheet now and EBITDA positive next year, um, I think that's, they're, they're in a good position right now. Yeah, and it helps but, a software company and not... Yeah, kind of right, thing. exactly. So 20 30% gross margin on the hardware, but they don't even make their own hardware. So they're really an asset light business, but then 80% gross margin on the software. So, you know, that's that's the part that gets me excited. Cool. Awesome. Sounds like a, sounds like a really uh, good idea that plays to a lot of these longer term tailwinds. Um, uh, what, do you want to talk about another company? Yeah, so this one's interesting. So I might actually do a write-up on this one on my Substack pretty soon because it's just such a unique story. So the ticker symbol is Z-I-M, Zim. So I, people are starting to talk about it on FinTwit. I think I've, I've been part of that, you know, trying to get people to look at this one. So shipping prices are freaking ridiculous right now. Um, mm -hmm. Like there are three or four different indexes that you can use to track shipping rates in different parts of the world, you know, whether it's like liquid or dry bulk or, you know, other, you know, like coal and that sort of stuff. But like across the board, um, shipping rates are up anywhere from like 5x to 10x over the last 15, 16 months, like just insane. Mm -hmm. um, Zim is sort of an asset light business where they like they have these long-term contracts where they're leasing these these ships and then renting them out to other companies mm -hmm. um and they just reported q2 numbers they beat estimates by like 30 percent raise q through guide q3 guidance by about 30 percent and increase their 2021 guidance by about 50 percent 
So this company has a market cap of five and a half billion, enterprise value of about six, although it uh, looks a little bit higher now because the stock is up 5% today. But like coming into today, it was like six, per, six billion enterprise value. And they're going to generate at least four billion of cash flow this year, free cash flow. And even if um, shipping rates come down 30 or 40 percent next year, they're going to generate another two billion of free cash flow next year. So you have a company with an enterprise value of six billion that's going to generate six billion of free cash flow this year and next year. Like I, I don't even know, what, I don't even know what to do with that. Like I honestly have no idea how to value this company. I mean, like I'm. I just wonder what they're going to do with that cash. I mean, they've already announced a $200 million special dividend, but that's like pennies to this company right now. So I don't know if they're going to implement like a real dividend or they're just going to start buying back stock. I have no idea, but as a shareholder, knowing that there's about 6 billion of free cash flow coming in by the end of next year, there's, there's like, there's almost no downside risk to this company because if the stock pulls back, they can just start buying back their stock. Wow, and if I look at um, if I look at like bulk uh, BDIY, I think is the uh, bulk to dry index. Oh, uh -huh. okay. I know you can pull it up. Yep, it's it's crazy. I mean, look where it was a year ago. <laughs> it's just right. insane. Right. So you had this kind of like so this was like the peak oil and, and peak commodities, and yep. it's been kind of like down here. Um, and then because of all these supply constraints um, on the shipping side. Um, did you learn anything kind of like um, over the past earnings season? Uh, any color on, on the shipping market or any like what? what um, yeah, I mean, so I, I had a couple positions and companies that actually did did 100% of their manufacturing in China. Uh -huh. And when they reported earnings, Q2 earnings, they were freaking miserable because the shipping prices were so high. It was just killing their margins. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what, I mean, and I had already had a small position in Zim going into Q2 earnings, but when I started listening to multiple CEOs on their earnings calls, talking about how horrible it was trying to get stuff out of China, mm -hmm. uh, just because the, you know, supply, supply chain constraints and higher shipping prices was really eating into their margins. I decided at that point, there's just no way that Zim is not going to crush earnings. So I, you know, doubled or tripled my position going into their Q2 report. Um, and now that I've seen the numbers, I'm continuing to add to that position because I just love the, you know, like I don't even, this isn't even a growth story anymore. It's kind of like a, a capital allocation story. Right. You know, how, how does this, what does this management team do with that $6 billion that's going to be sitting on their balance sheet by the end of next year? You know, how are they going to spend that? How are they going to return that to shareholders? Right. That takes a long time to get capacity, shipping capacity up. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and Zim hasn't traded for that long, but kind of see. Right. Here's yeah. It's a, it, it, they came public earlier this year. And obviously, it's been one of the, the you know, there's been some great tech, tech performing IPOs this yeah. year, like like Sentinel and Figs. Well, not, you know, not Figs so much, but uh, Doximity and Monday. But no one's really talking about this one. This might, you know, this might be one of the three or four best IPOs this year. Right, four bagger already. Not a, not a lot of not a lot of pullbacks. Um, I wonder if any. How many analysts covered? Let's see if that. Analysts. I don't think many, if any, really. Price target. I mean, so that, that like that's another reason that I do like the small cap, mid cap space because you you know you normally don't get a lot of analysts. So yeah. I think as an investor, you have a better opportunity of finding these kind of under the radar stocks that nobody is talking about yet. Yep, absolutely. So uh, looks like the, looks like you've had some coverage here. Uh, six analysts covered now, but still okay. pretty, pretty small for a five billion dollar company. But I mean, like you know, when I when I started buying Upstart back in December, I don't know if there was any analysts covering it yet. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of a lot of analysts won't even pick up coverage on an IPO uh, until they've traded for a few months, maybe you know, maybe reported a quarter. Yeah. Um, same thing with you know Celsius Energy Drinks is my second largest holding. Uh, I started buying that stock last summer when it was like a fourteen or fifteen dollars stock, and there really there was only one or two analysts covering it up until recently. And I think today, a company called Roth Capital picked up coverage, and they're only like the third or fourth uh, company that's covering them. So you know, market caps up to five billion. Uh, it's had a great run, but there's still very few analysts covering them. What's uh, the ticker? Yeah, uh, C E L H. 
So the, sto the story here is pretty exciting. Um, huge run over the last 10 years. I mean, this was like a penny stock a decade ago. Yeah. Um, they're competing against Monster and Red Bull and Bang. So those are like the three largest right now, Monster, Monster Red Bull, Bang. And then Celsius is, is kind of in that fourth slot now. And it's all about shelf space. It's about distribution. Um, and Celsius, when they reported Q2 earnings, uh, said that they're now in 100,000 stores and they work with 200 DSD partners. So over the last 12 months, they've picked up retailers like Walmart, Target, Costco, Kroger, um, Speedway, 7-Eleven. I mean, they've been just crushing it. And now they're starting to like introduce these cold coolers into a lot of those top locations, especially the convenience stores, mm -hmm. because half of all energy drink sales are in convenience stores. And most people are in there because they want to grab something cold, you know, grab and go as they call it. Mm -hmm. So having those branded coolers in prime locations uh, is just going to keep this sales velocity going, going even higher. Um, so they reported Q2 revenue growth of about 115% year over year. Um, and that's only because international is, is slow. Like in the U.S., they're growing 150% in retail and they're growing about 130% year over year on Amazon. Um, so international is actually the slowest part of the business right now. So how did you find a company like Celsius? So... I think one of my friends on Twitter actually introduced me to the company last summer uh -huh. and I tried the drink and I'm like, wow, this is so much better than Red Bull or Monster. Like, uh -huh. you know, if you've ever had Red Bull or Monster, I mean, it just tastes like, tastes like a bunch of chemicals in your mouth. Yeah. And Celsius is really a healthier energy drink. So, you know, they call it like a fitness functional energy drink. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't have the sugars, it doesn't have the preservatives, it doesn't have a lot of the, the chemical stuff that's in Red Bull, uh, and they actually put some healthier stuff in there for you, and they've done some third-party studies, like some research studies, to prove you know, all of their claims that they make. Um, so to the extent that someone's going to consume energy drinks, there's no doubt that Celsius is by far and away the healthiest of those four options. Wow. And I think people are gravitating to them for that reason. And it doesn't, like when you drink it, it's not, it's like a lighter, I mean, it, you know, you can do carbonated or non-carbonated, but it's a lighter, more refreshing taste than what you would get from like a Bang or a Red Bull. Got it. Okay. I mean, I, I drink uh, sugar-free Red Bull and okay. I, I don't say, I wouldn't say I drink it because of the taste. <laughs> uh, you drink it for the energy. You drink it for the energy, then. Uh, I think I'm just used to drinking it with. Oh, okay. You know, well, with, yeah. I mean, so I I would recommend trying Celsius. They have like 12 or 13 different flavors now. Um, everything from like tropical, tropical vibe to mixed berry to pear to watermelon to grape. Um, you know, my my favorite is probably tropical vibe or pear mm -hmm. um, or or orange. But, you know, everyone's tastes are different. So, you know, they, they give you some decent variety. Um, so, like, I can walk into my local Shaw supermarket or stop and shop. And, you know, you can now find Celsius in the same aisle with Red Bull and Monster. And, you know, they're growing that, that shelf space and taking market share away from the, the big boys. So, um, so, Celsius is where Monster was in, like, 2007. On the market cap basis. Sounds about right. Yeah. So Monster is actually one of the, the five or six best performing stocks over the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, like up, it's literally up there with Apple and Netflix and Amazon and uh, like tractor supply. I mean, there's, you know, Monster has just been an absolute beast over the last 20 years. I think it's up like. Yeah, there it is. 1,400. Uh, 1,453%. So there you go. And that's, and that's only going back to 2008. If you go back even farther, can you go back even farther than that? Yeah. There you go. 35% uh, kegger over. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Crazy. 40. Wow. That's, uh, that's, if you can kegger that in your portfolio. That's pretty, pretty <laughs> so I, I don't think Celsius is going to do that. Let's, let's see Domino's. Cause I mean, yeah, Domino's, is, Domino's has been a good one too. Not, not, not asking. <laughs> not even close. Wow. Yeah. So monster has been, I mean, just a monster wow. stock, but yeah. uh, I mean, no, nobody saw that coming. So they're a, they're a $50 billion company right now. Celsius is a $5 billion company. 
Um, some people will, like will point to Celsius and say it's expensive. You know, why does it deserve a premium multiple? It's a you know energy drink company with forty five percent gross margins, but uh, Monster trades at about eight times sales. Celsius trades at about sixteen times sales, mm -hmm. but Celsius is growing eight times faster. So, you know, uh, Monster is expected to grow about 16% this year and Celsius, according to my estimate, should grow, um, you know, somewhere around 115 to 120% this year. So not, not that, um, not that big of a, uh, I mean, it's a premium, but not that big of a premium. Right. For I mean, you're percent. right. I, I mean, I would argue that, you know, if Monster's trading at nine, nine times sales and growing at 16%, right. Celsius should be trading way more than, you know, twice the multiple with eight times the sales growth. So now obviously Monster is more mature, you know, they're more profitable. They've been around for 20 plus years. Um, you know, so the, you know, if you, like, if you look at the, you know, EBITDA margins and net income margins, Monster is going to look uh, a lot better, but you know, most of their growth is in the past, you know, right now, right now, Mon so the, the entire category as a whole, so the energy drink category is growing at about 9% a year. So Monster is growing a little bit faster than the category, whereas mm -hmm. Celsius is growing much faster than the category. Mm -hmm. Let's just pull up the, uh, the metrics that you mentioned here. So uh, yeah, six versus, but six versus 36 on a right, EBITDA right. margin. Yep. But I mean, like Celsius, so what's interesting is you can see Celsius using the old Red Bull and Monster playbook, you know, but kind of like the new age playbook where, mm. you know, like I remember when I first moved to Boston in 2007, I used to see a bunch of hot chicks in the Monster trucks, you know, driving all over Boston, you know, parking on the side of the road, giving out cans of Monster to people. Yep. Um, now, obviously, we have this, you know, we have social media, so we have influencers and Celsius, like if you, if you follow them on Instagram, you can see all of the celebrities that are, um, you know, kind of promoting Celsius to their followers. So they hosted this huge party down in Florida a few weeks ago, at, uh, end of July. And they had like all like the hottest influencer models. I'm like, I'm pissed. I didn't get invited, but like all the hot influencer models were all down there as they launched this new tropical vibe flavor. And they even got like Kim Kardashian to, to post about it. And I talked to the head of sales and he said they didn't even pay Kim. Kim just likes the product. Uh, so she basically did it uh, as kind of a freebie. So like these influencers, like they love the product so much, they're not even asking you to get paid to promote it, uh, which, is, which is pretty crazy. So uh, I'm curious to see like, the, like what's, what's, what's nice about this industry is that we actually have data to work with on an ongoing basis. So like the company doesn't provide guidance, but it really doesn't matter because every two weeks, Nielsen puts out their two week uh, scan data for retail. Yeah. Um, and then Stackline tracks e-commerce sales, including Amazon. So every 30 days we can see the monthly Stackline data. So I can start to crunch the numbers when I see that data and come up with some estimates for the quarter. And that's how I'm able to decide, you know, whether where I think Celsius is going to come in when they report their, their next quarterly earnings. So uh, so I'm waiting to get, I've already seen the, so for the first two weeks of July, um, retail sales were up 195% year over year. Wow. But for the second two weeks of July, I haven't seen the data yet, but that's when they started doing all of this Instagram, uh, Instagram influencer stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming if we did, if we did 195% year over year for the first two weeks of July, before those campaigns kicked off, then I assume we're going to see something above 195% for the second two weeks of July, once those campaigns did kick in. Interesting. Yeah, and, and so this is kind of like, I just pulled up one of my uh, templates here where I just have revenue and revenue growth. Uh, and you have revenue growth actually accelerating now, which is uh, interesting. Well, yeah, so I mean like, so that's part of my strategy, you know, growth stocks, you know, let's call it one third small cap, one third mid cap, one third large cap, because that's kind of what it is today. If you looked at my portfolio, um, reasonable valuations like i think the whole 
50 times sales is just freaking ridiculous and that's going to get people in trouble eventually when growth starts to slow down and the multiples contract like mm -hmm. I want nothing I want nothing to do with that so like I'm looking for growth companies that are trading at reasonable valuations like enterprise value over gross profit is probably my favorite metric to use mm -hmm. uh, as an as an indicator of you know future you know call it, you know positive EBITDA um, but I'm trying to find stories or stocks that are underappreciated, misunderstood, where you're going to see revenue acceleration, thus leading to multiple expansion. And that's what you've gotten with Celsius and Upstart, which are my two largest positions, which are both having very strong years because they've continually beat those estimates so that multiple keeps expanding. Cool. Love it. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks for sharing all these names, a really interesting stocks, and I'm definitely going to take a look at some of these uh, for, for myself. Um, before, uh, we, before I let you go, just wanted to make sure that we tell people how to find you uh, to the extent that you want to follow your views. Yep. Uh, pretty easy to find. I'm on Twitter probably more than anywhere else. So Jonah Lupton on Twitter, that's my username. And then if you want to subscribe to my Substack or my stock tweets room, the links are in my bio on Twitter. So, and I, you know, my DMs are always open. So if you have a question for me or you want to talk about a stock, uh, you know, feel free to shoot me a DM. Sweet. And I'll, I'll put that information in the YouTube uh, uh, description as well. And then uh, last thing is I sort of ask people for their recommendation um, on a movie or show that they're watching. Uh, if, if you want to, if you want um, to pick a uh, what God, what's a good show that I've watched recently? Um, so, this, I mean, yeah, this is, this has been a weird year, right? Cause a lot of the TV series that, you know, had to cancel their, yep. their seasons cause they couldn't shoot for the pandemic. So like the seasons that I'm most waiting for right now are billions, mm -hmm. which is a showtime show. And then the new seasons of money heist and Ozark. Okay. Awesome. Got a, got several in there. Sweet. Awesome, Jonah, thanks so much. This has been fun um, and uh, it's great to learn about your investment style and these stock recommendations. Thanks again. You got it, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, talk soon. Talk to you later. Bye.